I gotta try and do a better introduction this time. I'm Natasha, and... I'm Red. And together we are Syllogism, a science, culture, and philosophy challenge podcast on the edge of chaos. This week's challenge was to read Male Nipples and Clitoral Ripples by Stephen Jay Gould, published in Columbia, a journal of literature and art in 1993. Stephen Jay Gould was an outspoken critic of E.O. Wilson's sociobiology. Enjoy! The camera just... <laughs> That's perfect. That's perfect. <laughs> let's let's talk about them. I'll just probably be touching myself while you're Yeah, talking. that's I think that's a great way to to get started. <laughs> <laughs> put, take take my little my little uh, electrodes and, uh, and and put them on there and see what kind of party happens. Yeah, people are <laughs> like literally going to think you have like a testicle stimulator. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm so not, I'm, I'm not saying I don't, but <laughs> 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 okay, so let me try and not say any like super offensive things in the first like two minutes because um, that was just that was just classic me. And uh, what, so what was it? So, so here's the problem: um, I don't know what constitutes offensive, so I'd have to watch it again to know what it is you're talking about. So, what do you think uh, was offensive? And then how do I make sure that I don't fall into those pitfalls? Well, I mean, I'm think I'm not, I'm not even gonna like try to put parameters on it because that might offend you. <laughs> so, or it might offend me. <laughs> trying to delineate what is offensive would offend somebody. So let's just flow with it, and I'll try to be nice, and maybe you try to be nice, and then we'll maybe we won't. <laughs> I, People won't shut our podcast off in the first two minutes. <laughs> um. All right, so we're talking about Stephen Jay Gould. And um, uh, I don't know why I decided on this, but I came across his um, article, you know, male nipples and clitoral ripples. And I thought- I know exactly why you decided why. on it. Well, let's see. Um, what's the very top secret thing that uh, we began the book club with uh, way back then? Yes, Ratclitz, embryology right? of rat clits, yeah. Yes, so this is definitely an extension of uh, rat clitorology, <laughs> if there's such a word. Is that what your degree is in? And then, um, <laughs> you know, um, quite frankly, it's funny. So uh, I It is that. funny. Except yeah. it's actually um, a lot of this isn't, this is all just commentary, really. It's all just him, you know, I, I'm really interested to see kind of like where, you know, he did have some like monumental kind of things that he was famous for, right? Um, but I get the sense that these, a lot of these evolutionary biologists, they really just fucking like shoot the shit. You know, oh, his, his was the... Um, it was the stop start model of evolution. What the fuck was it called? I punctuated drew... equilibrium. Yes, punctuated yes. versus gradual. Um, that that's his claim to fame. And it's a lot of these things, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm ignorant as fuck, but I'm like, duh. Like <laughs> it, it's interesting to me, and I find this a lot. Uh, you'll notice that in some of the things that I uh, share. I will look at a neuroscience article and say, you know, yet another study that someone got paid for that did not need to be done. Some things are just, quite frankly, obvious, uh, and uh, you well, can. They tell have to be done. They well, have well, to be done. But these are analyses. These aren't really experiments. They're just looking at. Uh, I mean, a lot of this now is genetics. So they're looking at like the you know conservation genetics and like where where did this begin and where did this stop. So I think this is the big beef with a lot of evolutionary biology and especially evolutionary psychology is it's retroactive. Like we're not doing any real experiments here, like most of the time. So, no. so then the question is, how did, how did the insight uh, arrive? Did we arrive at sociobiology because of something we discovered in, uh, in, in the genome that gave rise to something socially or did we infer it the other way? Um, so how do we fuse both of those things? And then how did we decide that evolutionary psychology was going to be a thing uh, unto itself? So is this just 
uh, retrodictive uh, study, I guess, is kind of how I'm looking Well, at. that's the biggest critique of evolutionary psychology, that it's all bunk because of that. Um, you know, there's like really no way to kind of test the things that, and that's the problem with, with consilience, right, is you know, how, a lot of these things, it's kind of like where we're at with physics right now. A lot of it is all theoretical and it's damn near impossible to determine experimentally, you know, to empirically observe these theories that we're making. And that's, that's why the male nipple uh, is still a mystery. <laughs> and apparently uh, the female orgasm is also, I just read an article today, like by some, I don't even want to say what kind of woman it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me start with this. Was it a woman? It was a she, she, her. It was a she? Was so are we confused? She was a she, she was a she, oh, her. Okay. Yeah, gotcha. I mean, that were her pro those were her pronouns, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm perpetually confused. She, she identified as a, a she. So, but <laughs> she, the, the article was about how the female orgasm isn't tied to anything evolutionarily. It has no real purpose and why that's good for women, basically. Um, so, so our, our, all right, so it, it looks like, well, <laughs> it looks like we might be jumping to my favorite topic, the, the female orgasm. No, no, we're not gonna jump to it. You're right. Oh, we're so we're not. Save okay, that. I, Let's I, save that. Let's uh, save it because okay. that's the, you know, it's- Because that's the orgasms build. happen after you, you let it build up. Yeah, we exactly. have to build to this. We're gonna yeah. build, to, we're gonna build. Yeah. We need foreplay first. So talking about uh, Stephen Jay Gould <laughs> isn't my idea of foreplay, but. <laughs> <laughs> We'll just, so the, so the, the interesting thing, which I did not know about Stephen Jay Gould, um, I actually didn't know much about him, but, uh, and I wonder if premising this entire thing with this is, is obviously skewing everyone's opinion, but I didn't realize it until after I read some of his stuff that the main criticism of him was his political ideology and kind of where he originated from. Are you familiar with this? No, I'm not. So uh, fill me in. So his parents, I guess, were part of the Communist Party of North America or something. Um, you know, he was raised very much, you know, in that ilk. So he can, you know, people, people have referred to him in like reading criticisms of him. They refer to him as a Marxist. Um, and that's his, uh, I guess, bias. But he admits this bias. And in, I don't want to go too far into his work, but because I'd love to do, I'd love to do another podcast on the mis mismeasure of man in some capacity and the bell curve, which were, you know, kind of two big things. He was famous for kind of, he wrote the mismeasure of man, but he was critiquing the bell curve. Um, but the, a lot of people were saying that his main interest was in political ideology and trying to come up with kind of like biological excuses for why his political ideology should work. So, so. Is, there, is there something biological in uh, his writings that is somehow tied to uh, those ideologies that you could say, yes, I can see uh, a thread here and this is what explains it? Well, the idea of non-adaptation, um, non-adaptive evolutionary traits, um, I think is, well, let's just say it, it's very nihilist to, to believe that, and, I, and I, I know he doesn't believe all traits are not adaptive, right? Or didn't, you know, God rest his soul, I guess. Um, but- He's been gone for a while, actually, and he, he died quite young. He did, yeah, um, it's a shame. Basically, let's talk about the male nipple. Let's get into, let's, let's get into it. So <laughs> why don't you go ahead and give the synopsis of the male nipple well, <laughs> Since you are an owner of such I, I, useless I, I pieces of shit. I don't, I don't know if I can talk about this without, wait, I need to dim the lights a little bit more. Hold on. I, I think, I think my nipples are blushing. This is like, this, we're going to get banned from YouTube on our second video. <laughs> I need to start over. You're going to edit this down to like no. 13 of, of usable content. The, all the minutes. will be like, you know, on some other site, parlor or something like that. No, God. Odyssey, Od oh, Odyssey might not ban us or something like that. Get her. Uh, <laughs> okay. 
So, uh, so the most important takeaway for me is that uh, number one, the male nipple is highly functional, or at least it's potentially functional. And, <laughs> that was your takeaway. And, and, and I'm gonna. That's not gonna, what he said. I don't care what he said. He didn't know what he was talking about. So, so, so look. Um, so, so, so essentially. Um, the male nipple's existence has nothing at all to do with the existence of something that's non-adaptational. In fact, it is quite adaptational at the level of uh, not Stephen Jay Gould. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould. Dr. Uh, Brad. Well, he didn't adapt too well. He passed away. So, and I'm still here. So, <laughs> okay. So, 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 so anyway, the, I think I lost your mic for a second there. It's either that or you're just mouthing. I just, I would like gasp. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, you need to edit that one out. So, um, it, in any case, uh, it has its origins in mammalian embryology, and so uh, at, before uh, exposure to testosterone, uh, it, the male fetus and the female fetus have uh, some points of undifferentiation. So it's only with exposure to testosterone that uh, males get certain traits, including uh, well, these nipples that are related to uh, female nipples. And uh, I think the operative word for the entire thing here, uh, both between the nipples and the clitoris uh, and the penis is homology. So the male nipple and the female, the female nipple are homologous. Um, so it's not that it has no function and it evolved for no reason. It's simply that it winds up differentiating uh, from the female nipple at the level of the embryo. Um, so, so therefore my nipples are valid. <laughs> Nobody said your nipples are invalid. <laughs> you... <laughs> Jesus. Look, so, so, I don't even so, know so, where to go from there. Yeah. Doing this. That is not time. what he said. That is like your, <laughs> that, that is your fucking thought uh he he basically said the exact opposite that okay so what did he say because he's wrong so go ahead he said basically some things just come along for the ride doesn't mean they had to well he doesn't mean they had oh, to, yes. had a purpose it just means like what does he use it's the radial sesamoid and um so he is famous for coining and um what do you say his name? Wanton. I always read it. I don't know how to say it. Wanton. Um, they're famous for the spandrels and panglossian um, ideas. So a spandrel is what happens when you're building arches. And I'll yeah. have to link like a um, picture of it. So you, you naturally get those kind of corners uh, mm -hmm. where, that have to be, you know, kind of filled in when you're building arches next to each other. And a spandrel is that exact arch. And they, they become decorated not because they serve a function, but just because they're kind of vestigial. They're like a remnant. They're, some, it's, they're just there. So he says male nipples are just there. You know, it doesn't mean that they had a purpose or they have a purpose. They, they're like the skin on your elbow. Like they just are fucking there. What's another, mm -hmm. uh, what did he say? Oh, chins. Um, I can't wait to do Sapolsky because Sapolsky actually talks about chins Sapolsky, too. Right. We're going to do a podcast on Sapolsky. Yeah. So chins, a human chin is supposedly a spandrel. It's just kind of something that, mm -mm -mm. why the fuck do we have it? Uh, it, it doesn't have a purpose. It, we just do. So contrary to what you are saying. <laughs> <laughs> We're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna have to lob this back and forth because I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna circle back uh, Pisaki style and uh, and fill in why I think I'm still making sense. Well, I'm annoyed that I have to side with him because I actually side with you. Uh, I mean, not really, but I'm trying. <laughs> to, I have to like feel. I have to actually represent what the fucking man said. So okay. one I, of us has to. Yeah, I agree with what you're saying, I, and I and I and I'm very biased. So. so men can lactate. Yes. We, we, we know this. Under the right hormonal circumstances, you can induce milk out your titties. Um, yes. And so, and so this uh, hormonal circumstances, uh, what is it? Hyperprolactinemia, I believe it is called. And uh, by the way, um, you don't want to experiment with that because prolactin <laughs> suppresses both testosterone and estrogen and will give you all kinds of problems. Typically, I when was going to experiment. That's something you would do. 
look. <laughs> all, right, all right. So sorry, I, I actually have a vial in the other room. I'm going to see what happens. Shut um, the fuck up. Really, I, it, I don't even know if you're serious. You will. No, I'm not serious. I, I'm strange, but I, I'm not doing that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but but it will uh, shut down spermatogenesis. Uh, and I did a little bit of digging to see whether or not there was a correlation between uh, obesity in men, uh, high levels of estrogen and prolactin. And there doesn't seem to be any in part because uh, high levels of prolactin will also suppress estrogen. Yes. So and, and, and quite contrary, actually, prolonged periods of starvation, like what happened in World War II, you can actually stimulate lactation because your liver enzymes aren't working as fast. And so they don't shut down the, pro okay. the prolactin production. So that can actually happen under the right circumstances, but it's usually under starvation. Okay. I, 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 I thought there might also be something like, uh, and, and I, I don't know anywhere near as much as you do about this, but I was thinking perhaps like a pituitary tumor or something of that sort. Yeah. I should know all this, but it's been years since I've studied anything having to do with pituitary. But I do remember, uh, you know, this old myth of people saying like, oh, well, you can't get pregnant while you're breastfeeding. Anyways, oxytocin and prolactin, there's some shit that happens. Basically, you will not fucking ovulate like, while you're, you know, do, having a suckling. So, but, but otherwise, like how many women do I know who have gotten pregnant because they were under this assumption that, well, I'm breastfeeding, so I can't get pregnant. It's literally not true. Um, well, I mean, from what I understand, you, sh you shouldn't be engaging in any, you know, activities while you're breastfeeding. But usually what you do is you take what? the baby <laughs> and you decide. and then all of a sudden the oxytocin levels go back down and uh you know you get all kinds of other uh, floods of hormones and b before you know it you're uh pregnant again yeah you're good to go <laughs> yeah so i mean i mean the pituitary is so interesting there's so many interesting things that happen um but the but this really isn't about that this is about nipples um and <laughs> Whether or not they have meaning, do, do nipples have meaning? Um, well, I mean, if I had to say like, yes or no, like are, are nipples adaptive or non-adaptive? Um, I'm gonna say, no, they're not, they're not adaptive. I'm on team non-adaptive. Um, In men? Yeah. Okay. Because okay. they didn't and, and, used to lactate, like it, it, they didn't, used to do something <laughs> they just yeah. come along like and also there's if you think about the evolutionary pressure to like not have nipples there's none there's actually positive pressure for men to have nipples because in the event um <laughs> what did ken say he was like well can you imagine if you're like in a cave and like there's no food and you know the mom dies or whatever then you know maybe it'd be good for the man to be able to lactate just in case so, so the evolutionary so would have to also be starving. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that would mean he did not cannibalize his child. Um, so, so there, he's he's way way out there on this one. I'm I'm not sure. I think this is a really bad. B I was side. trying to I was trying to make it work in my mind. Like, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah he's, there's a man in a cave. The wife is dead. The woman is dead. Okay. Um, but anyway, so there wouldn't really be pressure for the nipple to go away. Like, is what I'm saying. Well, well, and and the, the and the problem is, uh, you know, again, it originates in embryology, and so, you know, you're going to have this nipple, and and it's this is this is actually a result of I think uh, the parsimony of evolution. So you are not going to create a, a different set of genes uh, in order to have a mildly different morphology in a man versus a woman to erase the nipple, and the energy that uh, would be required is just seemingly silly uh, in the way that we think about how things are pressured to evolve. So in uh, the embryo, uh, we are the same until, until testosterone makes us not. Well, I see where you're going. You're going in like a, like a direct like lineage where, where the nipple actually comes from in, in development. But evolutionarily right. yeah. speaking, we, you know, if you think about where we all come from, the sea, um, like a good percentage of fish are hermaphroditic. 
Um, not, you know, we're talking obviously about fish, which are not mammalian, you know, that's where the nipple starts is in mammals. But the first um, common ancestor, um, is it Sino is it Cynodontia? I can't remember, but it's the fucking ratipus type thing. It's, um, it's like a goddamn uh, platypus rat monster, like the thing in Ice Age. <laughs> <laughs> You know what I'm saying? The, um, the ice, I, 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 I know what you're saying. I, I, I wish I had, I wish I knew the name off the top of my head, but I don't. I, I know what you're saying. The ratipus. <laughs> the ratipus. <laughs> the Morgan, uh, I wrote it down. The Morgan, Morgan, you con, fuck, I can't even think of it. Morgan, some shit. Again, I'll put it in the show notes. <laughs> um, but, you know, that's, that's kind of where the first nipple supposedly should have been born, right? The first nipple born. <laughs> the first nipple. There was no way that this show wasn't going to be 85% laughter. <laughs> well, I'm glad because I felt hella dumb reading. Like, I got so far down the Stephen Jay Gould fucking. I was reading critiques of critiques of his critiques. Like, I'm like, oh my, this is, this is not for 45 minutes. Like, no, we're going to have to do. We're gonna have to do more on this because there's, there's. I think we we need to we need to, we need to uh, fasten ourselves uh, to the nipple. Nipple, and, yeah. And just stay on. Lock the, on the, the nipple. <laughs> and and apparently, I mean, there are uh, th- there are human hermaphrodites, right? Uh, so there there is, there is some. Uh, I that word. Uh, hermaphrodit- hermaphroditism, I think, or is it hermaphrodism? I think we dropped the tid. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know what? <laughs> no, 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 we don't. <laughs> the titta stays. Titta. Hermaphrodism. Oh um, my! Oh my God! This is great. Yeah, this is good. This is high quality, high quality content. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, I was just thinking a lot about like manatee milk, and um, I actually googled manatee milk. And this is not a plug for manatee milk in any way, but it's Did you order some on beer, the I think. There's a beer called manatee milk. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So anyways. <laughs> <laughs> I, oh, so, so he talks about like um like the dew claw. I don't think he actually talks specifically about the dew claw, the false thumb okay. in a, in the panda, yeah. in the red panda, because he did write a lot about and study, he studied red pandas. Right. So he and talks he, about he also talk about the homology there. Yeah, uh, yeah. You you go for that. You talk. Uh, about it. I think word. I think you're still going to know more about that than I do. You like, but, uh, but apparently, like homo. You like you like hom- sameness. Uh, I, I like well. I don't know if I'm going to take that as a compliment. Uh, I don't know how to. I don't know where to go with this. I have sensitivity around this whole conversation with my nipples. I can't wait to shift it your way. <laughs> <laughs> Great. but but so so apparently and you know I, I i do not remember the details as well as i i need to to make to make this sound uh as okay. good as it ought to but they're uh apparently within uh within the species there uh is both a uh, a a dew claw like structure uh, in the, I think it's the, it's the arms or the four, the four legs, but then it also shows up in the hind, in the hind legs. And it's just that it's easier to duplicate and have it be the same throughout rather than to have them be different. Uh, and so in one case, it has a kind of functionality and in the other, it doesn't, but it's just easier for it to, uh, to show up in both instances, which again, kind of sounds like, uh, the male nipple. Yeah. Yeah, that's that sounds about right. I don't think I don't think I did that. I don't think I did that justice. You I didn't. You did I it didn't well think enough. about it as cl- I didn't think about that one as closely as some of the other things, like trying to figure out what was going on with prolactin and whether or not, uh, you know, a, a man could, uh, you know, for instance, be selling jars of uh, milk on eBay like this woman who was selling her farts recently. You know, <laughs> like, can I do that? I, I mean, you know, just asking for a friend. Uh, yeah, I, I think I think we could milk you. Um, what's the line from like Meet the Fockers? Is like I have teeth, Greg. Can you milk me? Says, yes, Robert De Niro. We could milk you. So he talks. So he talks a lot about these like like these growth fields and stuff. And it got me thinking a lot. Like I I took embryology in grad school and I I loved it. Actually, 
Now I won't pull out my embryology book, but I loved embryology and I actually studied um, fibroblast growth factors. I actually have a fucking pub publication on it, if you believe it or not. Um, I need to read it. Now you don't. Yes, I do. It's virtually useless. Um, so the, but anyways, I, I found this, like these, I was thinking about like midline structures and how we all develop from the midline. I mean, cause you know, it's, it's not impossible to have more than two nipples, right? And they, they often migrate oh, from the midline. I, I've, I have, I have. Uh, you have a third nipple? Yes, I, I don't have a third nipple, but I have uh, been uh, in the presence of. Uh, have you? Yes, I have. Uh, it made me wish I had three hands. It's 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 a it's a party. Trust me. If I if I could have been like one of these Hindu gods, uh... <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. That'd be great. But yeah, so there's I mean there's all kinds of interesting things in um in embryology, especially when it comes to genitals, because the thing oh, that can I, I ask you just really quickly before yeah. you uh well so you're talking about this um this growing from the midline and uh I, I there's isn't there a word for that that i that 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 is, i i don't know it there's this word uh like dehiscence i think it is that comes to mind but i don't think it has anything to do with that necessarily and and so so i, I guess i'm ignorant of what the language is and but i but i know there's something hmm. and so i was wondering if you might happen to know it um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, obviously, like everything grows from from the midline and then out distally from that. Yeah. So, like, you know, I mean, if you think about like, you know, hand development or arm development, you know, begins proximal and then it kind of extends out and then your little fingers extend out. Okay, but, so dehiscence apparently is uh, the bursting open of a pod or a wound. So that's not it. So, yeah, I... Well, like, are you thinking like... I had, this, I had this idea, but... Like uh, you're thinking, I'm like, I'm thinking of things when like the midline structures don't close. Like when you can have, what is it called? Um, um, I always forget how to say it, omphocephaly, where you have like a, basically like a hernia, like your, or you can have your in the back where your spine is herniated and protruding from your, from your body because the midline doesn't close properly. Okay. These are, these are things that can happen, but the, you know, when you look at, have you ever seen like a pregnant belly, they have this line, the like linea alba. But the body is full of these raphes. I mean, I don't know if I'm fucking. This is a problem with people who read too goddamn much. Like, you don't know if you're saying the fucking word right. Raphe, raph, raph. It's a raphe. I, 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 I have lots. I have lots of words like that. I never, ever, ever have to say them aloud. And then the first time I pronounce them, I'm like, wow. No, there's no <laughs> way that's great anatomy. Cool. I should know this word. No way. And then if you ever go and you try to get a proper pronunciation. Uh, and you play one of these YouTube videos, and it's like some robot voice trying right. to <laughs> like, uh... even worse than you are. Yeah, it's <laughs> you can't know unless someone has said this to you and you use it in normal conversation. Your capacity to pronounce it drops to almost zero. You know, I, I look at I look at genitals too much. Like from <laughs> wait, wait a second, is there such a thing? Number one, number two, where are these genitals coming from? And <laughs> I, I'm just way too fucking curious. You know, my mom had this medical book when when I was a kid, and you know the medic you had. Did you have the medical book? Of course. You know, I mean, I bought one for Nova. She's me ten. And it's like, they have all the pictures of like the development. And I remember as a kid, I was just like, like, is that, is that, where am I at? What stage? Where is this? You know, like just, where's, where's mine? just like <laughs> way too curious about all these different. Mm. And then I, Jeremy sent me this, <laughs> I'm not even, I'll just put it in the show notes. <laughs> this is like, what kind of a dick do you have? Um, it was, it was great um okay well i i, I might oh, we didn't to, send you that one yeah, okay. I, I, I need to know if, he won't listen so we can talk shit anyways so oh he won't why won't he listen oh, what's wrong <laughs> so anyways like i just got caught in this whole thing and there's like this perennial raffe that i got like kind of stuck in it was like spike dick all over again like when he sent us those pictures of what was that called again uh the papillary oh it was yeah spike dick. <laughs> <laughs> and we was just like what the fuck i i i don't know all i know is every time i see something with a, a little spiny it's the first thing i think of spiny dick oh god 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, maybe spiny dick is good for, for clitoral ripples, but are we ready to move to that topic? So, uh, I, am, I, I, I was born ready for this topic. No, wait, okay. We're, right. like, we'll have to make a formal transition, but because okay. people say we need more transitions. So basically he moves really quick. He moves, so basically he moves really quick out of um, talking about nipples um, when he basically like puts the nail in the coffin on how, you know, useless they are. And when he, you know, talks about them as like Lamarck's um, from like a Lamarckian uh, perspective mm -hmm. saying that they're not useless or they're not useful and not everything has to be useful. And so period, he was just basically saying that. Uh, yeah. He can say what he wants to, but he 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 apparently was lacking uh, nipple sensitivity. Whatever. Okay, so then he then he really wants to go into that. So right after that, then he says, you know, there is one. What here's the breasts of all the breasts and teats of all male quadrupeds to which no use can now be assigned. So he's quoting uh, Charles Darwin's great grandfather Erasmus. That's 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 name. That almost also sounds like some kind of a weird uh, disorder. It's like you have the Erasmus, don't you? It's a, it's a fucking great name. <laughs> I love it. So then he basically moves straight into talking about um, the female orgasm. So he wants to talk about Freud so bad, like he wants to just like shit on Freud so bad, like understandable, understandable. Mm -hmm. um you know poor, but, but the reason why he wants to shit on freud is because <laughs> he says that he's come from this androcentric point of view uh, that you know freud basically just wants it to be all about the dick and it's not freud <laughs> so so I, I, I mean, I, I don't even know where Freud got some of these ideas. So like the, the most, uh, I, I, I don't know, the, the most irrational uh, one, I think of all is just this idea that, uh, you know, young women have clitoral orgasms, yeah. but, but for a woman to mature, she must switch from clitoral to vaginal orgasms. Yeah, or she's frigid. Oh, or she's or she's frigid. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Did this guy ever spend even two seconds with an actual woman? Freud was no. like a, the original no. incel. Freud was, he, this is an incel in the manosphere complaining about women and not owning up to his own shit. So basically he's saying, uh, you know, that the uh, freud was wrong freud was fucking problematic <laughs> he can't use this word but he says why in particular does the existence of clitoral orgasm seem so problematic so basically like freud was was just big mad like we said he wanted uh you know he wanted it to, he, to be responsible for the orgasm but he could have been he could have been just use a different organ or organ uh uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, he should have used a different organ other than his brain to figure this out. Uh, <laughs> this is exactly where you need uh, experiment uh, to confirm your theories. Uh, this, this harkens right back to our idea about how some things just don't amount to something that's, uh, let's see, predictive or consilient. <laughs> And it certainly isn't, it's certainly non-orgasmic. Uh, so. it, it doesn't meet the qualifications for a theory gang bang. How does it, it's not a theory gang bang. It's, uh, it's, 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 it's garbage. And any, and any man who is actually in bed with a woman. So, and this is the problem maybe, is that he was uh, hypothesizing uh, alone in a room, the very first, the prototypical incel, um, and uh, talking about it, uh, talking about mommy and how you might still have the hots for her and stuff like that. And all these weird ideas that were incestuous and, 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 and orgasmic. And, and I, he just had no clue. Well, also, and, and then there were men out in the field, in the field, my brother, <laughs> get it on. And they no. were 
able to, and they were able to figure this stuff out, I think. Not entirely. No, I think you're wrong. I think this, I, how I imagine Freud sitting there in his room is like, he got all his bros with him and his oh bros are like, bro, like my girl just, what's her deal? She like, she can't, she don't like it. She don't like the D and, and he's like, <laughs> got to figure this fun out. <laughs> It's like, she doesn't like the D. She's not a woman. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> I can't believe this is where this is going. This is, this is what we did. This is what we do. Uh, this is what so, we do. So. This is actually a, a, a paradox. This is what they call the clitoral paradox or the clitoral orgasm paradox, um, where a clitoral orgasm or a woman's orgasm let's get it straight because all orgasms are clitoral um a woman's orgasm is not uh, does not correspond to directly to her reproductive success so unlike the male whose orgasm is strictly required for reproduction the female orgasm is not so this presents a bit of a problem <laughs> yeah so, this is this is no good. So he says, for men, maximal pleasure is linked with the greatest possibility of fathering offspring. And I, so, I my notes up right here. <laughs> but my first thought in reading this was like, you motherfucking dipshits. Like, we've talked about how women are choosy, right? And this is something he goes on to talk a tiny bit about. But I feel like they just, you know, from what I'm understanding in the literature, um they dismiss this um so my first thought in reading this was a female is more likely to mate with and allow reproductive success to happen with a man who she feels connected with who has been able to figure out the paradigm the paradigm the paradox <laughs> and the paradigm and the um, right the perineum <laughs> <laughs> had to slip that in there <laughs> <laughs> but he does go on to talk about this so then he wants to talk about kinsey and he wants to talk about mm -hmm. masturbation which i uh, fully support um because it was really a revelation back then to them that that this was that like orgasms were clitoral like they're like what what do you mean but i was really surprised to read in the hit report the hype report that they found of 3,000 individuals that 79% of women who masturbated did so by directly stimulating the clitoris and only 1.5% used vaginal entry. I wrote, really? I, I cannot believe that that's, uh, that that's accurate. Now, not that the, I, I think the women using clitoral stimulation is likely uh, at least that number, but the, the, the vaginal uh penetration let's let's be let's be real um so what else did they do i want to read it because they're saying um 79 who masturbated did so by directly stimulating the clitoris what did the other you know 21 well, I, I i'm i'm thinking maybe the 1.5 percent were just you know uh using uh they, they were just penetrating and hopefully, perhaps they would have an orgasm just through penetration uh almost and, impossible uh, yes you need you there's it, it's i mean the, the clitoris is a giant organ um i don't think really, people realize how big the clitoris is though like it's huge yeah. it's huge it has legs it's like yeah it's <laughs> it's, it's wrapping around yeah. doing all kinds of wild stunts um so there are all <laughs> Kinds of ways uh, to to uh, really confusing a lot of men right now, probably. Yes, yeah, so I think we need to draw. I would draw a diagram, but it would get me in a lot of trouble. <laughs> okay, I'll put it in the show notes. Jesus, but it, but I know but, it's going to confuse people more. It's probably but, less is better in this front. Like there are but, some things people just don't need to know. But here's here again is where you can see homology, right? So if you look at if you look at the the structure of the penis and mm -hmm. the structure of the clit, you will see. Uh, very clear relationships uh, in in structure. So yeah, basically, the shaft is internal. We would say of the you know if it were the homologous to the penis, the shaft is internal and actually split apart because we know the penis is another one of those midline structures that kind of comes together. The labial fold, folds come together and create the shaft. 
Um, and the clitoris kind of like morphs up inside. <laughs> 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 but anyways yeah, i mean so the whole 1.5 percent. i'm thinking they didn't have really good dildos back in 1953 uh, well think yeah i'm sure materials were limited i'm sure most of them were making their own uh and uh do you remember those yeah. plastic like those like hard cheap plastic dildos from like 20 years ago or so i'll have to link one now because they were mm. I just can't believe, I just can't believe that was, that was an option. Like, yeah, the evolution of sex toys, I'm sure has gotten wild. It's, it's wild. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's extraordinary. However, even with that, uh, I, I would say there's no replacement for uh, actual intimacy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so something I came across that was really uh, interesting, I thought, was uh, supposedly they're used, they're ancestrally, supposedly, uh, within Eutherians, which includes us, um, there was uh, a, uh, a kind of ovulation that happened in response to orgasm. And so- Yeah, spontaneous uh, ovulators. Yes, yes. So, um, so it seems to me that um, there might be some, you know, reasonable arguments that uh, once we began to have uh, this cyclicality and and we no longer needed to have uh, orgasmically induced ovulation that would have brought about, uh, you know, the release of an egg in much the same way that uh, we release uh, we re release uh, semen, um, you know, it maybe was possible then to separate uh you know the the orgasm or, or at least to separate yeah to separate the orgasm from ovulation a lot of mammals do not experience orgasm at least not that we can measure we've talked about this mm -hmm. previous he says um orgasm is most parsimoniously interpreted as a potential all female mammals possessed and it's just not been shown to be so yeah, uh, especially not from intercourse, like at all. Um, so that you know, and this gets into the whole you know sexual behavior thing. Um, but yeah, so 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 this Sarah Hurdy, Sarah Hurdy in 1981, she took out. Nuts. What's that? Her name drives. There's something about that name that drives me nuts. Yeah, just that. Just where can I buy a vowel? No, no, <laughs> not, not a not a one. Um, so, but she took up cudgels, cudgels, if you will, against androcentrism in evolutionary speculation, not branding the entire enterprise as bankrupt, um, but basically arguing for the whole pair bonding thing, um, or she turned, she, she argued against the pair bonding. Mm -hmm. Um, she said, she actually said, so what I, my thought, my first thought was that, well, the reason it's not tied directly to orgasm is because of females for, um, you know, mate selection purposes have to be picky. They have to be choosy and have the right mate, you know, that's willing to go the extra effort and do the damn thing to, if he, if he can't take care of this, like, what, what are we going to be doing down, down the road here? You know, like I'm going to need a mate that's going to bring, bring home the motherfucking boar, if you know what I'm saying. Um, so she says, Sarah Hurdy with no A, uh, she says, that this is an adaptation for promiscuous behavior, permitting mm -hmm. females to enlist the support of several males to prevent anyone from harming her baby. So basically, if, if her main dude dies off, then you know she can she can replace him with another one. When I read this, the first thing that came to my mind was um, there's um, so here's another one of those where I don't know uh, the the uh, the author, but I should. Uh, but there's a book called um, Sex at Dawn, and somewhere in Sex at Dawn, uh, the author uh, talks about how there are tribes where it's believed that anyone who has sex with a woman basically contributes to the formation of the child within her. And uh, so each one, uh, you know, this is obviously, you know, pre-scientific, but at least it's starting to approximate an idea of what's going on, which <laughs> means 
which leads itself to a, a kind of theory about uh, female uh, promiscuity. Um, so such that all of these people uh, who have had sex with her before the birth of the child will kind of galvanize around her and act as a kind of extended uh, family. So, so there is, I think, something to this, at least uh, in some very removed tribe, yeah. uh, you know, um, wherein certainly uh, a larger group would have been available to protect the child, among other things, uh, I'm sure. This to me has like, to me, this reinforces like the um, devilish woman stereotype, like right, you witchy woman, you ensnared me with your clitoral orgasm. <laughs> Well, well, yes, but this and this is also a women are just like men and equally promiscuous kind of theory, too. And so so it's it's both that they're they're evil and you can't determine uh, you, there's no paternalistic certainty. Uh, but uh, but also it gives women a license in a way uh, for her survival and her child's survival uh, to be promiscuous. So it's if almost there's validity if there's validity to well, it. Well, well it, 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 just as as it stands, realizing there may not be much validity to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, the folklore, I, I get what you're saying, like the folklore. So, so, so like, yeah. We tell these stories to like explain our behavior as much like the uh, she, her article I read earlier about how the dissociation between orgasm and intercourse is good for women. It's good for us. There was, there was definitely some commentary about what kind of uh, you know, emotional involvement it would take any one man uh, to, to bring a woman, uh, you know, uh, to fruition. Um, <laughs> look at me, all of a sudden I'm, you know, being... blushing. So, for instance, oh. the fact that it typically takes a, a, a woman quite a bit of time to uh, experience the level, uh, you know, the, the orgasmic arc as compared to a man, to become aroused at all and to be relaxed enough to become aroused enough to allow these things to happen. W what it takes for a woman means you need to be able to kind of luxuriate in those feelings and know that you're not threatened. A, a man can ejaculate, look, somebody could be shooting at you. <laughs> I'm going to ejaculate, run down the street and do it again. Right. And, and I don't even have a gun, but damn it, I am going to I'm going to stop somebody from shooting me with that thing. Right. But this but this does not happen uh, for a woman. Not that it never does, but it's uh, but I would say it's so it, it's so infrequent that the there are a lot of barriers yeah. that you need. You need time and attention and uh, and focus and genuine care about the other person in order to. Uh, yeah to bring that about well he tries to say it's not a dismissal so he's concerned about how women are going to feel he's concerned about uh mm -hmm. are women going to feel like their orgasm means nothing like it's 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 meaningless and i'm like why would it, it no it, like i don't think i mean first of all i don't think it's non-adaptive i i think I maybe male, male nipples are mo like pretty non-adaptive but i don't think <laughs> <laughs> I mean, y'all don't ever use them. You don't use them, bro. It's a, you have a, you have an appendix on your chest. Like it's a vestigial remnant. Like, <laughs> you know, like don't That's be. It. I, 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 I want, I want like a, a male nipple and, and clitoral like sumo wrestling match. I think that's how we solve this uh, dilemma. I mean, I'm pretty sure y'all would lose because. <laughs> I have two, just you saying. Know? Yeah, I mean, and women you're fighting are over here gets again from behind. See that? Yeah. It just happened. <laughs> look at look at what what people are doing today. They're growing their clits. Like your nipples, I don't see men trying to grow their nipples. Like so. Well, well, well you um, have not been paying attention to what's going on in the trans community very much now, have you? To grow your nip? No, they're not growing. No, I'm sorry. Oh. They're not trying to grow their nipples. They're trying oh, to. Anyways, I'm I'm not gonna argue with you, Brett. Your nipples are useless. <laughs> I mean, my clit is my clit is very useful. Um, yeah, my nipples are using me as a as as a kind of uh, marionette right now. I haven't spoken a single word. My nipples. Are <laughs> so one one thing I wanted to say about him. <laughs> I mean, you know, he he annoyed me with his little like. Uh, oh well don't worry ladies like your 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 orgasm isn't useless like it's 
you know, I'm glad for you. And he tries, tries to tie it back into like Freud and saying like, you're not frigid. You know, this is, this has a good, you know, this is a good thing for women. He actually calls it, oh, I got to write, I got to read the thing about Freud really quick because it was fucking uh, hilarious. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm so he, goes, he goes back to Freud and he's talking about, like you said, little girls shifting their orgasm to a vaginal orgasm as a sexually mature woman. Freud writes, when at last the sexual act is permitted and the clitoris itself becomes excited, it still retains a function. The task, namely of transmitting the excitation to the adjacent female sexual parts, just as, to use a simile, pine shavings can be kindled in order to set a log of harder wood on fire. <laughs> I have to tell you, that was, I was laughing <laughs> so hard reading that. I was like, you know, he just couldn't have chosen better words for that. <laughs> So basically, However crappily wrong the theory is. Um, <laughs> so my clit is pine shavings to set your wood on fire. Okay. That's right. That's right. Set that wood on fire, baby. <laughs> right. That's, I mean, I got a hand. I, I wanted in the beginning, I wanted so bad to say, I thought Stephen J. Gould was not a good writer. Um, I mean, and he technically he didn't write this. He, he, I think he's not a good writer. His sentence structure sucks. And um you know, I can say a lot of things about that. He's pretty boring. He's no, he's no E.O. Wilson, that's for sure. He's no E.O. So I, so I, I, I think that what maybe what, and maybe we've said this already, but I just wanted to be clear that um, the female orgasm, because of what it takes to achieve, and by the way, what happens when you do achieve it, um, is actually adaptive because it helps to ensure the survival of the species. It, I, th I think there is- Stress there, theory again. I think it's unequivocal that uh, it, it strengthens uh, the pair bond. If we were to, if we, if we all mated like men, um, it would be over and done with quickly. We wouldn't have the, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even have the time to be awash in all the other uh, it, luxurious chemicals and, and sensations uh, and appreciation of another person because it would take almost nothing to achieve. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a no for me, dog. Like we ain't have, like, especially now today, like in our little fits and starts, a punctuated evolution, wherever we're at, if evolution still applies to us, homo deus, um, it, if you can't make it happen, I ain't had no kid with you. What the hell? <laughs> like, are you fucking getting me? It's an absolute requirement. So what would you pick on that would say that person would be a good enough lover even to be able to do these things? Well, now we're getting, are you talking about physical attributes or like? Does it, what comes to you first? So if you're going to make that choice, what would drive that choice? Uh, yeah, I think, well, I think women, I think, like I said, uh, in our previous podcast, I think women, it kind of catches them by surprise, uh, unless he's like strikingly good looking. And then you're like, okay, I'm, I'm paying attention. Right. Otherwise it, things just happen to you and you're like, okay, that sounds good. Yeah. That seems right. That sounds good. So I think, I mean, women in general, you know, these studies have been done. Now I'm going to have to find this fucking study because I'm going to say it. <laughs> women prefer status and financial stability, power, ultimately, in a, in a mate. And men prefer youth and beauty. Like, right. I don't know. Somehow it's going to be racist to say that. But um, so well, men's, men's physical appearance is a lot of times less important to women than it is to men. Yeah. Uh, again, the uh, the idea of things take time. You need to feel secure and 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 so forth. What's going to allow you to do that? It's going to be that status. It's a high status person is going to be More able potential. to provide, yeah the potential mm -hmm. for that kind of um, that that kind of environment so that things can happen the way that you would like them to. Right. That's why women like um, will look at a an out of work musician or an artist or something and be like, he's so dreamy because they see potential when you're younger. There are definitely cues. And I think, you know, we're not even talking about evolution anymore because we've like jumped into hyperspeed. Like we don't even need men really to reproduce anymore. So give me an give me a nucleus and, and an egg and we've, we've got a, a baby. Well, so. 
before too long, we are not going to need each other for reproduction, uh, at least not directly. But what is it that holds us together when we no longer need each other? Ooh. Dun, 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 dun. That's the topic I wanted to score when we talk, discuss when we talk about uh, the rise of androgyny and non-binary envies, um, because that's, I think, this like, um, I don't want to call it an andromorph, like that's what I was thinking, but that's like, I'm thinking that's like where your brain is split, you know, male, female. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I think that's, that's where we're headed is kind of this, like everybody's a switch kind of thing. Okay. I can, I, uh, I mean, I, I can see us having been uh, androgenized. This is a separate, this is its own podcast. It is definitely. Yeah. We're just, we're just sampling it. But yeah, I mean, so I think in conclusion, uh, Freud's an idiot. <laughs> but, 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 barely. <laughs> Kinsey's the man. And the jury's still out about Stephen Jay Gould. He's not a good writer. <laughs> uh, okay. Oh so that's, okay. yeah, that, that, that would conclude our show. <laughs> 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 oh my god that's the end